Hello folks, uh, another broadcast here. I don't know what's gonna happen this Sunday, so I'm going ahead and preparing a lot of videos. Um, today is Friday, it's 3.39 and we're filming, and uh, just got back from my run. Hannah and I then went for a walk, so it's a beautiful day. I hope that you've been able to get outside and, and experience some outdoors time. Uh, anyway, trying to get some filming in because we don't know what's going to happen Sunday and so I'm just preparing these and if we end up having services Sunday, hey, all the better. We've just got more material. Uh, we talked last time about the kingdom of God and that's mainly related to our Acts study, the study that we've been going through in Wednesday night class. And I'm going to continue on with some things along that line. Uh, one of you had asked about baptisms. I had mentioned that there were eight baptisms in the New Testament and somebody had a question about that, and so this one is going to be on baptism. This lesson is going to be on baptism. Again, if you are uh, following along online, you like the worksheet that goes along with some of the classes, I've prepared a worksheet. Uh, this one you'll need to go to Drew Leonard, or uh, cadleonard.com, c-a-d-l-e-o-n-a-r-d.com, uh, cadleonard.com, and go to the materials tab again. And once you've selected the Materials tab, there's going to be uh, another place in that platform that's going to be uh, labeled or called Baptism. Select that one, and the worksheet you want is Baptisms in the Bible. And that's the worksheet we'll be going through if that's the material. We're going to approach this four different ways. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is some preliminary matters. Uh, we kind of followed the same structure last time, talking about the Kingdom of God. Oh, and by the way, this one will be a little bit shorter. Um, I've heard your complaints. An hour and 18 was maybe a little long, but hey, some of you may have liked that. Who knows? Anyway, this one will be a little bit shorter. Uh, we kind of followed the same platform, same arrangement last time. We're going to talk about some preliminary matters. This one, then we're going to talk about uh, literal baptisms, literal immersions. Uh, the third thing we're going to talk about is a metaphorical uh, immersion and some of those surface in the New Testament text and then the fourth thing we'll do is we'll close with some complex matters some complexities and hopefully tie it all together and bring it to a close again this relates to the book of Acts in a large way because uh, while we're not going text verse by verse we're doing that in our Wednesday night class you see uh, right now we're doing some more uh, supplemental material that we're dropping alongside of our study in Acts and this will help us when we get back into the text in Acts chapter 1 and verse 15 on Wednesday night. So let's talk about some of these preliminary matters. You need to know this. There are eight different baptisms listed in the New Testament. Now, I've read some people who say, well, there's seven, and they try to combine two into one. I get that. I'm not picky about the number. The point is that there are several different baptisms, immersions, in the New Testament. I've read another individual who says there are ten. He kind of divides up some things that I would put into the same category. There are eight different baptisms. And well, I'll give you a list of those at the end of the lesson. But we need to know this. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, Paul writes about the ones. And he says there is one, and he goes on in 4 or 5 to say there is one baptism. I understand that clearly to mean that he is saying there is one baptism unto salvation. And what he's talking about there is as opposed to all these other baptisms that we read about in the New Testament. Paul's not denying that these baptisms exist. What he is denying is that all of these amount to having to be performed in order to be saved. That's not the point. In Ephesians 4.4, 4, he's saying only one of these baptisms engenders to salvation, leads to salvation. And that's the one that's constantly reiterated in the New Testament. You'll see this as the lesson goes on. I'm going to go ahead and insist, before ever even proving it, I'm going to insist that what he's talking about in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, the one baptism is baptism in water. And anybody who denies that, it seems to me, has a very shallow, I'm going to use the word ignorant, and I mean no offense by that, but somebody who denies that it's water baptism that Paul's talking about as the one baptism in order to salvation simply has not read the book of Acts. Simply just has not read the book of Acts. The book of Acts seems far too clear to say that it's some other baptism than water baptism. I know people, you know people, who say that, well, the baptism that we're supposed to be involved in is a Holy Spirit baptism. That's the one baptism that is authorized as being in order to salvation. Now, the Holy, the Holy Spirit baptism is a difficult topic indeed, but to say that it must be performed in order to be saved 
is complete utter nonsense. And that's because in the biblical text, it's never used that way. Look at any of the pa passages that talk about the reception of the Spirit. And it's always, the Holy Spirit's reception is always one exception for that. One exception. It's the household of the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. So says Acts 11, 15 through 18. But, but other than that one case, every single time you read about the reception of the Spirit, it is after, as a result, and not before, water baptism or salvation is granted. Now here's the point in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. That's as a result of what they've already performed. So it is in Galatians 4, 6. Listen to this one in Galatians 4, 6. He says, And because your sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. I'm not picky right now at this juncture as to what we make out of Holy Spirit baptism. That's not the point at this moment. All I'm saying is that somebody who says that Holy Spirit baptism must be performed in order to be saved simply is flying in the face of all of the New Testament texts that simply say that the Spirit was granted as a result and not in order to be saved. It was as a result of salvation. The Spirit was granted after they were saved. And so one simply cannot have one being immersed in the Spirit in order to be saved and then also as a result. It has to be one or the other. You've got a temporal problem if you say that it's both, or if you say that it's in order it's in order to be saved, then you've got the problem of all of the New Testament texts that say, no, 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 it was received as a result, as a gift, after having been saved. Okay, so we talk about there are eight baptisms. Point number two, you need to know this. Every single time that the, bat, that the word baptism or immersion, either one's a perfectly, perfectly fine English translation. It's baptismos or baptizo. Those are the words that we're working with in the Greek text. And those are translated to mean in the English baptism, immersion. The idea that we're talking about is a full uh, immersion in water. Or for whatever uh, other remarks we might have in the New Testament, it may be some other quote-unquote element. But what we're talking about is a full immersion, fully submerged into the element that's described. Now... On question number two, you need to know this. Every time that the word baptism is used in the New Testament, it speaks of water baptism, a literal baptism, a literal, the word you're looking for is literal, a literal baptism in water unless, unless the text explicitly qualifies it as being something else. So we do have cases where the immersion in view is not water baptism. But when that is the case, it is going to tell us. The text is going to draw that out for us. So we can't simply go off on a tangent and say, well, I understand the Romans 6, 3, and 4 talks about baptism, and we understand it to be about Holy Spirit baptism or something else like that. Every single time the text speaks about a baptism, it's speaking of water baptism, a literal baptism in water, unless the text explicitly identifies it as being something else. You need to grasp that point. Because I'm going to come back to this question, question number two, later on in the lesson, a couple of different times, where we have some difficult texts. But if we grasp this point now, it's going to make it far easier when we work with those in just a moment. Every single time that the text speaks about baptism, it's speaking of water baptism unless the text explicitly identifies it as being something else. And we'll see examples of that here in just a moment. Now, there are some cases where baptism or immersion is used, but it's speaking metaphorically. Well, that goes hand in hand with question number two that we just read. Uh, the point that I'm making here is this. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, I'm going to go ahead and read this one. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, John comes into the wilderness. He's preaching to the Pharisees. And in 311, he says to them, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Well, that's, he's speaking of literal baptism in water, you see. But then in verse 11, he says, But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, how do you know that he's talking about baptism in the Holy Spirit and with fire? He says so. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, John comes out and says it. 
But if he didn't say that it was with Holy Spirit and he didn't say it was with fire, we wouldn't have an idea about that, would we? He has to qualify it. So when he uses that word baptism, he's qualifying it and letting us know that he's not using it in the standard sense. He's not using it in the literal sense. He's talking about something metaphorical. And so the word you're looking for in question number three is we do find examples of metaphorical baptisms or figurative baptisms. And this is just one of those. Matthew 20 is another good passage. In Matthew chapter 20, you might remember that uh, the sons of Zebedee and the mother come and ask. They start asking Jesus about his kingdom. And in Matthew chapter 20, turn over there and read this one with me. And 20, beginning in verse 20, we want to start with the, the passage there and the, grab a little bit of the context. In Matthew chapter 20 and verse 20, here's what happens in the scenario. Follow along, 20 verse 20. It says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons, James and John, uh, may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup? You might remember in the garden where he says, Let this cup pass from me. The same idea. He's talking about his suffering, the Gethsemane experience. And so he says in 22, Are you able to drink of the cup? that I drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. And they said unto him, We are able. And he qualifies this, look at 23. He said unto them, You shall drink and eat of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on the right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. What cup, when he describes the baptism as being the cup, he's, he's making the two the same, you see. When he talks about the baptism that he's baptized with, or he talks about the cup that he's drinking of, what kind of thing is he talking about? He's talking about the persecution or the suffering for the sake of the good news, the sake of the gospel. And so when Jesus is talking about a baptism here, he's talking about the baptism of suffering. Now, who could believe that somebody could actually take an individual and immerse him in an element of... Of suffering, as it were. You can't do that. You know that suffering is not some element. You can't measure it. Uh, you can't grab a hold of suffering and measure its molecular or atomic structure. You just simply can't do it. That's not the kind of thing we're talking about. We're talking about an abstract thing. So when Christ speaks about baptism as being a baptism of suffering or drinking of this cup, and he's talking about the Gethsemane experience, and he says in the James and John that they can partake of it too, what's he talking about? A metaphor. He's using it as a metaphor. He's using it figuratively. And so we're not to think of this as being a literal baptism, but it's speaking figuratively. Okay, point number two then, our second section. Question number four. There are literal baptisms. And for, and for instance, the best one is just to, to give instance of this is perhaps John 3, 23. In John chapter 3, uh, uh, yeah, 3, 23 of John's account, it's talking about John's baptism before the cross. And it says in 3.23, John was also baptizing in Enon near to Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. Now, we don't have time to read it, but take the time on your own and look at Mark 1.4. John verily baptized with repentance unto repentance for the remission of sins. So John has a baptism. It's literal baptism in water. It is literally for the remission of sins, but it's in prospect of the cross. What are we talking about here? We know what we're talking about. We're talking about a literal baptism. We're talking about it being for the remission of sins, looking to the Christ's blood on the cross. And John has a baptism that's rather quite literal. So somebody who comes along and says, well, we don't believe in water baptism. I understand that John's speaking before the cross, but nonetheless, this sets up something for what's happening with the baptism in the name of Christ. To follow. Do you not think that three years prior to the death of Christ, that John's baptism, which was rather preparatory for the Christ, do you not think that that was somewhat of a transition or somewhat of a, a setting up so that people would be familiar with this practice once Christ died and then demanded it of the Christian economy? 
Of course, of course it would be. And so in John chapter 3, 23, we see this kind of thing. Luke 7, Luke 7, 29 and 30 is another good passage where the Pharisees rejected the counsel of God unto themselves, not being baptized with the baptism of John. It was critical. It was critical that they get immersed in the water. Why? Uh, if you want me to work out all, the, all of the mechanics behind it, you want me to work out the why, I don't have anything better than to simply say this is what God demanded. In 2 Kings chapter 5, you'll remember when Naaman was supposed to dip in the water seven times, wasn't he? And in 2 Kings 5, he said, well, what about Abana and Farpar? He said, are these pools, these rivers, are they not better? They're cleaner? The Jordan's filthy? Who wants to go there? It didn't matter. We don't know all the mechanics of why God said what he said, but we know this, God said what he said, and it was required of Naaman to do it in order to be right and cleansed from the leprosy he had. Well, it's the same thing with baptism. I don't know why to question God. I don't have the right to do that. But what I do have the right to do is obey God, and when he demands water baptism, I don't need to work out all of the details and the whys and the mechanics. I need to just be obey, uh, obedient. I just need to submit to God. And that's what's happening with John's baptism, and this is rather preparatory for what's to happen after the death of Christ. So we're talking about John's baptism. It's a literal baptism. Well, question number five, what about Jesus? What about his baptism? Well, it was literal as well. And so in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15, he comes to John there at the Jordan, and it says that he was baptized. It's a literal baptism in water, but his is for a different purpose. He can't very well be baptized for the remission of sins, when the text says he hadn't sinned, can he? See, in Matthew 3, 15, Jesus is without sin. He comes to be baptized with the baptism of John. And the text lets us know why he did it. To fulfill all righteousness. He's setting forth a pattern. He's setting forth a, a type. Really, he's setting forth his own model that you and I should follow. But it's, uh, he wasn't baptized for the remission of sins. The text lets us know he was without sin, and it lets us know he was baptized to fulfill all righteousness, Matthew 3, 15. So here raises a question then. We need to get this one. Take a look at Acts 2, 38. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And uh, let's start in 37, Acts 2, 37. Now when they were pricked in their heart, Peter's preaching to these Jews, the wicked Jews, who had put Christ on the tree. When they were pricked in their heart, they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, 237, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And in 238, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. He doesn't give us some qualification of this being some metaphorical baptism. He's saying be baptized in water for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So this raises a question. Is there a difference? And if there is, what is it? But is there a difference between the baptism of John and the baptism in the name of Jesus? And if there is a difference, what is the difference? Here is the difference. John's baptism was in water, literal water, and it was for the remission of sins. It looked forward to the cross. It was prospective. John's baptism was prospective and looked forward to the cross. The baptism of, in the name of Jesus, again, was in literal water. And also, like John's baptism, for the remission of sins. But it looked back retrospectively. It was retrospective and looked back at the cross. Do you see how John's baptism looks forward and Jesus' baptism looks backwards? So it's not to be debated then that people today are to be immersed in water for the remission of sins and we're looking back at the cross. It's nonsense. It is nonsense for somebody to simply say, uh, it is nonsense for somebody simply to say this, one does not need to be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38 says so. Acts 22.16 says so. And for somebody to deny that, they're flying in the face of the New Testament. It's talking about a literal baptism. It is for the remission of sins. It is in the name of Jesus. And somebody says, well, no, 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 no. Jesus did the work on the cross. Of course he did. That's why we're baptized. You see that from the text. Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16, Romans 6, 3 through 7. He's looking back at the cross. Don't you know Romans 6? When he says this, um, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Should we continue and sin that grace may abound? God forbid. 
How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Anybody who's being baptized for the remission of sins is hardly seeking salvation on his or her own merit. It's because of Jesus and his work on the cross that we are being baptized. And because of that, he says this in 6.4, you can rise to walk in newness of life. In the same way that he died, buried, and resurrected, so you and I can do it by linking ourselves to Jesus, we can come up out of the tomb and walk in newness of life, resurrection life, resurrected out of sin, death, and new with Christ. And so he says in 6.7, for he that is dead, dead to sin, that is, is freed from sin. He's talking about through the body of Christ, through the act of Christ. That's why we're baptized. It's not because of my own merit. It's because I want to do what Christ did, and I want to be part of all of that. He beat death, and I want to do it as well. And so Romans 6 is painting all of this nonsense to somebody who says that we're being baptized and somehow nullifying the death of Christ on the cross. That's hardly what the text has in view. And so I'm not doing it for my own merit, but we're baptized in, these, in water for the remission of sins because it's simply what God authorized. Now, all of this brings up questions on 6 and 7. It was for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. And then question 7. This question surfaces, how was there a difference? I don't have time to deal with Acts 19. I want to tell you this. In Acts chapter 19, without reading the text, the individuals that are being baptized there are baptized a second time. And by baptism, all I mean there is they're being dunked in water a second time because the first time they had done it was still in prospect of the cross, in prospect of the coming Messiah, but he had already come. So here are individuals in Acts 19 who are being baptized with the baptism of John after it's already been nailed to the cross, after it's already been taken out of the way. John's baptism is no longer valid because Christ has now come. And these individuals, these about 12 men, so says Acts 19, 7, get immersed in John's baptism, looking forward to the coming future kind of stuff. They're still waiting for a Messiah, still waiting for the event of the cross. And Paul corrects them in Acts 19 at the city of Ephesus and tells them, ha, he's already come. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, 19, 4, 19, 5. Acts 19, 4, Acts 19, 5. And so with John's baptism, how does it differ from the baptism today in the name of Jesus? John's baptism was in prospect of the cross. Jesus' baptism, or the baptism in the name of Jesus, is looking back in retrospect of the cross. One looks forward, question number seven, and the other looked back. When you and I were baptized, we looked back at the cross. Those that were being baptized with the baptism of John looked forward to it. And there's the difference. There's the difference. Okay, so let's talk about some of these metaphorical baptisms. Number eight, you've got a bunch of these, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time fleshing all this out. Question number eight, you've got a baptism in fire. Baptism in fire. Now, maybe somebody says, well, fire is a literal element, and it's speaking literally. That's not what the text has in view. Now, I'm aware that fire is an element quite like water is an element. But it's interesting that baptism in fire is nowhere commanded. Who would want to be baptized in fire if it were a command? That's just not what the text is going for. Nor is it the, it's the same way with the Holy Spirit. We, I mean, we could say, well, the Holy Spirit is an element in the sense that we try to articulate about all that. That's hardly what the text is going for. In Matthew 3.11, if we believe the truth of question number two on our worksheet, that every time that baptism is talked about, it's a literal baptism in water, if we really believe that, then all of this other stuff in Matthew 3.11 starts to fall into place. When he says baptism in fire, he will baptize you in fire. He's not speaking literally. He's speaking metaphorically. From the Old Testament, I'm going to spit out a couple of references here and jot these down, read them in your own time if you will. But he's alluding back to passages like Isaiah 5.24, um, Malachi 4. 1 through 6, Malachi 4, 1 through 6. That's definitely in Matthew 3, 8 through 12. He's grabbing a hold of Malachi for sure. These kinds of judgment passages are in view when John preaches all of this. So when John says he will baptize you with fire, he's using it as a metaphor, immersion in fire, for judgment. Now what judgment? Maybe he's speaking of AD 70. It sure looks that way to me. 
I know some people who don't like that. I think that's what's going on in the text. He's echoing these other passages in the Old Testament that speak of national judgments upon whether it be Jerusalem or it be Assyria or Babylon or Egypt. Christ is doing the same kind of thing, or John is rather, in Matthew 3, 8 through 12, by evoking some of those Old Testament texts, and he's making it a figurative reading. He's using it as a metaphor. It speaks of judgment. And it sure looks to me from the tenor of Matthew's book that, especially by the end of the text, he has in view the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. When the Romans come in, that, it seems to me, is what he's got in mind when he says baptism of fire. Now, I'm sure that there are some overtones there about a final judgment where every kind of judgment where God vindicates his rule, his sovereignty, and he humbles the oppressor. I'm sure that in all of that, there is that timeless truth embedded that God reigns. And so, therefore, there's coming a day where God's going to do the same thing to all of humanity. I don't doubt that any of that's true. But I'm saying from the text of Matthew 3, 8 through 12, I'm sure that's not what Jesus and John are going for. I think they've got something far more immediate in view with the fall of the city and especially these wicked Pharisees who have been oppressing those that are trying to live faithfully in Christ Jesus. That's what's in view in Matthew 3. Well, then this helps us also with the Holy Spirit. Question number nine, John and Jesus, John and Jesus also mentioned something about baptism in the Holy Spirit. So said Matthew 3.11, and Christ later says it in Acts chapter 1. And verse 5, he tells the disciples in Acts 1-5, he says, You will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Are we to think that with the baptism of the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead, physically, spatially, takes up residency and submerges the apostolic people or broader than that, in the Holy Spirit, in the third member of the Godhead, in Acts chapter 2. I really don't think that's the way the text is going. That's just simply not the way that the text is using baptism when it describes it as a metaphor. He's not speaking about a literal immersion in the third member of the Godhead. He's speaking of a, of a metaphor. Now, I don't care if you take what view on how the Holy Spirit indwells, uh, how he fills, he pours out, how he's... Uh, all of that, all of that. I, that's not of concern to me right now. What I'm arguing for is I do not think that one should say that the, the people of Acts 2 were submerged or immersed in the third member of the Godhead. It's used as a metaphor. And we need to do some work as to understanding what is he meaning when he does use it and evoke it as a metaphor. But nonetheless, there's a second metaphorical baptism, baptism in the Spirit. We talked about this one, so I'm not going to give a whole lot of time to this. But number 10, Jesus was said to be baptized. He was going to be baptized with the baptism of suffering. Matthew 20, 20 through 23. And we already read that, so we won't re-hit it. But uh, the baptism of suffering is obviously, this is perhaps the clearest of the three that we've talked about so far. This is quite obviously a figurative or metaphorical baptism. He, you can't immerse somebody or something in suffering. And so he's therefore speaking of, uh, of a figure. He's speaking it as a figure. And then question number 11. This one's an interesting one. Paul spake of the baptism of Moses, but he's using this as an allegory. Now, if you haven't done much with figures of speech, look it up on Google. Type in, pause the video, type in Google and uh, see what it says for allegory. I don't know what Google says. I haven't looked it up. But I'm sure Google will give you some kind of good definition. Maybe you're a Bible student, a real Bible student that has a lot of books and that sort of thing, and you really like to dig into things. Maybe take a look in Milton Terry's book on biblical hermeneutics and look up what he has to say about an allegory. Or maybe look up, uh, there's a less, uh, this book's not as good as Terry's. But Dungan has a book on hermeneutics. And look up what he says about allegory. Anybody who does anything with like the science of interpretation of the Bible will give you a good definition of what an allegory is. But nonetheless, even if you're not, uh, you're not loaded over with books, um, just look up on Google and see what it tells you an allegory is. That's what Paul's doing in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So let's turn over there and give this one a look. Um, for those of you who 
really are addicted to books and reading and you really like to read some thicker material, get, get Richard B. Hayes. Uh, he was a professor out of Duke. Get Richard B. Hayes' book called Echoes of Scripture in the Epistles of Paul or Echoes in the Scriptures of Paul or something like that. Uh, look it up on christianbook.com or um, that one, Echoes of Scripture in the, Gospel, or in the Letters of Paul, is published by Yale. And he's got another book, a couple of books, published by Baylor University Press. And Baylor carries his books called Echoes of Scripture in the Gospels, Richard B. Hayes, and also Reading Backwards by Richard B. Hayes. Uh, good, good material there. He does a good job with 1 Corinthians 10. Let's take a look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, moreover, brethren, remember, he's writing to the church at Corinth, and he says this, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Hmm. And he says in 10.2, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, you and I have read or heard of people that try to say, well, this is a literal baptism. It's in water. Look, I'm one of those who doesn't think that this is a literal baptism. I don't think that's what Paul's going for. I think that Paul is using a much more creative atmosphere about this text. He's not insisting on a literal baptism in water. I get that the cloud and the sea, all of that is elementally water. I get all of that. But that's not what Paul's doing. And here's why. Take a look at 10, 3, and 4. And they did all eat the same spiritual meat. Interesting, but then in 10.4, we really start to see he's using this as a figure of speech. And they drank all, uh, and they did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and he just casually drops it in there for us. That rock was Christ. Not literally. He's speaking figuratively, and the figure of speech that he's evoking is an allegory. He's speaking all of this, which was historically true. We know that story. The Israelites left Egypt. They walked over on dry ground. They came out on the other side. God delivered them. They start murmuring about the water source. God feeds them. Uh, he also gives them the water out of the rock. All of that happens. And Paul lets us know, well, where's Christ in the story? He gives us what we would call a Christological reading of this. He's not insisting on it being a literal thing where Jesus is actually the rock. He's using the text as a metaphor, and he's using it to say this. You've been questioning God and his presence, and you know God was present back under the Exodus. When y'all came out of Egypt, you know that God was the one who did all of that. What Paul is doing is he is insisting not only was God there, Jesus, this, this man, this boy out of Nazareth, that you've been doubting as the Messiah? Paul says he was there too. And what he's doing is he's attesting to the divinity, the deity of Jesus Christ. Nobody could any longer just simply say, well, Jesus is just another man. He's just another boy out of Nazareth. We know of his parents, Joseph and Mary. No, Paul's saying something much more critical, much more heavy. He's saying this. Jesus, though a man in a sense, he's also God. And he was back there, and he was the one that delivered you out of Egypt. He was the one that brought you through the Exodus. And that's why in your New Testament you'll read so many different passages that evoke the scenarios as listed of the Egyptian Exodus. Christ is doing this to show that in a prototype he was back there with them as well. He's always been with them. The faithful remnant has always depended upon Jesus the Christ, even before he came to earth as a man and took on human flesh. Jesus was there back then as well. Paul is using this metaphorically to speak of a baptism as an allegory. And he uses this to attest to the divinity of Christ. Let's close this out with some final matters. There's one more uh, that really comes up that's a difficult one. And this is 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Now it's very important at this point that you've grasped the truth of question number two. Question number two said something about baptism. Whenever it's used in the New Testament, it always speaks of a literal baptism in water, unless it's stated to be something else. In 1 Corinthians 15, 29, Paul talks about baptism from the dead. And how is he meaning, uh, what's he meaning, how is he meaning this in this passage in 1 Corinthians 15, 29? 
there are two ways we can go with this. Start in 15.1. If you know much about the book of Corinthians, books of Corinthians, you know that there was a, a party that was infiltrating the church, and they were infecting it with a disease, a return to Judaism. They were saying, let's go back into the old law. This party is commonly known as the Judaizers. And so in 1 Corinthians 15.1, watch the pronouns. Moreover, brethren, I, Paul, declare unto you, the Corinthians, the gospel which I, Paul, preached unto you, Corinthians. It does this through the text quite a bit. We get to 15.29, and look at this. Instead of the I, you, first person, second person, first person, second person, Paul introduces a third person pronoun and says this in 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? Who's the they? Maybe he's speaking of the Judaizers. Maybe he's speaking of this rogue third false party. Maybe he's speaking of them. He's speaking of a false third party, the false teachers that have come in and they started saying, you need to be baptized. And so in this scenario, maybe it's the case that the, the Judaizers were speaking of a false or a proxy baptism. And Paul grabs a hold of that teaching that they were erroneously involved in. And Paul says, think about it. The Judaizers who are denying the resurrection of the dead. Read the context and you'll see that's the problem here. They're denying the bodily resurrection and the possibility of coming up out of the grave. Maybe it's the case that Paul's saying in 1529... What shall they, these false teachers, do denying the resurrection of the dead? Why are they being baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? What's the point of practicing this baptism, this false proxy baptism, if the dead don't rise? Maybe Paul's grabbing a hold of this false teaching and he's saying even the false teaching that they're propagating is one that attests to the truth of the bodily resurrection. And maybe Paul's using it that way. I don't think that. I don't think that. But nonetheless, I read an individual who suggested that, and I think it's one that we need, at least need to consider. I don't think that's the right way to go with all this. If you've got the worksheet, look at uh, 12b. Maybe we should say this. Remember, the baptism here is not qualified as being a baptism in some other element. He's not using it as a metaphor. So maybe we should read it like this. If there's no resurrection... What is the meaning of people's being baptized on account of their own dead selves? Maybe we should read it that way. Where Paul is not saying that this is some proxy baptism or some erroneous baptism, but maybe Paul's just asking the Corinthians, if you don't believe in a bodily resurrection from the dead, then what's the, why bother with baptism? What's the bother about? Why would you be baptized hoping for salvation, hoping for a future life with Jesus, if you don't believe in a future life with Jesus. What's the point of it all? And maybe that's the way that Paul's going with it all. You need to know this. The word dead in 1 Corinthians 15, 29, in the original syntax, is in the plural. So he's talking about dead people, plural, not just a dead person, Jesus. He's talking about dead people. What shall people do which are being baptized for their dead selves? Why would I, why would any of the people at Cherokee Church of Christ want to be baptized? Doesn't that action alone suggest we, we anticipate something beyond all of this? It does. And maybe that's the point that Paul's getting at. I think that. And that allows for the text then also speaking of water baptism as we've listed in point number two. And so that's difficult. Now I told you I'd give you a list. Here's the closing to all of this. There are eight different baptisms and we've talked about each of them. 13a. The baptism of John. The baptism of John. We looked at that. The baptism of Jesus. The one to fulfill all righteousness. Number two, 13b. 13c. We talked about baptism of water in the name of Jesus. For the remission of sins. Literal baptism in water. 13c. He's talking about baptism of water in Jesus' name. To be performed today. For salvation. Ephesians 4.4. 4.5. Uh, D, baptism of fire. We talked about baptism of fire. It's a metaphor. Speaking of judgment, baptism of the Holy Spirit, a metaphor. What does it mean? You'll have to read on your own. Do some, uh, do some searching for yourself. Come up with a good view. I've got some good materials. If you're really interested, message me. I'll get those to you. Number six, baptism of Moses. Baptism of Moses, obviously allegorical, metaphorical. 
Seven, we talked about baptism of suffering. And last, we talked about the baptism of or for the dead. Now, here's the point. In Matthew 28, Jesus leaves a command to the disciples, Go, therefore, and teach all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe even what I've commanded you. If Jesus commanded the disciples to baptize for the remission of sins, then that thing is cyclical and it's still happening today. They're still, we're still to be speaking the same message. We were to be taught the same message that Christ taught to the disciples upon leaving earth. And that was that there was one baptism. It was for the remission of sins. It was literally in water. And we're not denying the cross of Christ, but rather we're looking to it as we obey God in the act. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus. We thank you so much for uh, his accomplishing uh, victory over death. We thank you so much that you've provided us a means through the watery grave of baptism whereby we can contact him and contact saving blood. We thank you for passages like Romans 6, 3 through 7 that lay that out for us. And we pray that we can take this truth to the world as we know that they desperately need Jesus in their lives and that they need to be freed from sin as well. We pray that you'll bless us, keep us. We know that we're going through a difficult time in our nation. Help us be strong, rally around each other, and hopefully be back to fellowship and assemble with the saints at a very soon time. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.